Okay, starting a new book today. Chumash Dvarim. You want the Chumash? You want the Chumash? That's the Biurim book. We'll get we'll get the Biurim soon. So Chumash Dvarim is radically different than all of the other five books that precede it, for the simple reason that here we don't have Hashem, so to speak, telling Moshe Rabbeinu what to say, or we don't have the narrative, as, as the Ramban puts it, as Shlishi Hamedaber. But instead, we have Moshe Rabbeinu speaking. Moshe Rabbeinu speaking. Eila Hadvarim. These are the words that Moshe Rabbeinu said. And the Gemara tells us, and Tzvitz elaborates on this idea of Shchinim with the Beres Bdei Gerenish. Moshe Rabbeinu is speaking, and Moshe Rabbeinu is becoming a direct conduit to to the, to the voice of Hashem. It so to speaks utilizes Moshe's voice box, and Moshe during the last five weeks of his life becomes so seamlessly connected to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that what he says is, is a direct communication. And Moshe Rabbeinu begins his final sermon, which is the Book of Adam, starting on Rosh Chedesh Shvat, which concludes on the seventh day of Adar, which is the day of Moshe's passing. Moshe Rabbeinu begins with veiled criticism, or a veiled rebuke. He starts off by telling the Jewish people, he talks about places, and he mentions geography. The obvious problem with the geography is, if you read it carefully, it turns out that these places are not next to each other at all. It's like he's giving his coordinates, and the coordinates are not, they don't, they don't match. He's like in one place and at the other place, seemingly at the same time. So clearly, it's not, he's not describing geography, but rather he's recounting geography because he's in a veiled way reminding the Jewish people of different things that happened in different places, and kind of just mentioning the word is enough. A simple example, if you say the word Entebbe, to a Jew at least. They don't think of, uh, of Uganda or they don't think of uh, something about the African country. You say Uganda to a Jew, uh, Entebbe to a Jew, he thinks of rescue at Entebbe. That the name of the place is enough. Uh, a name like Auschwitz, as we don't think of it as a town in Poland. If you hear that name, a name like Treblinka, it means something. So these are names that major things happened. Tell somebody Twin Towers. It, it, it's, not a, it's not a location anymore. It's, it's an event. So I wish I had been mentioned these events. And interestingly, towards the end of those events, of those places, he mentions places which occupy the same space as Atlantis. They don't even exist. He talks about places which are euphemistic. They're not even real names of places. But again, Moshe Rabbeinu very gently, very subtly, alluding to different things that the Jewish people did. And here he's, he begins his final sermon, not with a joke, but with rebuke. And Rashi talks about that and explains why, why Moshe Rabbeinu, in fact, did this and why he waited until now. And the Torah does tell us that this is it's 40 years now. The Torah gives us the real coordinates. The real coordinates are that they are on the other side of, in the land of Sichan and Eg, preparing to enter into Eretz Yisrael. And that's where we're going to pick up today's class. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 5. Here's the real coordinates. The real coordinates, where, where are they really? They're really Be'evet Hayarden. That's where they really are. They're really on the other side of the Jordan River. And Moshe Rabbeinu, Be'eretz Mayav, in the land of Mayav, this is real, because we finished that initial kind of rebuke by mentioning of places. And, and Rashi also, the Chumash also tells us, and Rashi explains that it's Achareh HaKaisi Asichan Melech HaMeri. He waited not only just until the end of his terrestrial lifetime, but also waited until after his military con conquest, so the Jewish people wouldn't say, oh, you didn't even do anything for us. You didn't bring us into the land of Israel, but you're giving us some kind of rebuke. And Moshe Rabbeinu, therefore, completed several successful battles. Battle theaters closed, land conquered, and at that point, the Eved Ayarde, verse 5, tells us on the other side of the Jordan River, the Eretz Moyav in the land of Moyav, Ha'il Moshe Be'er Es HaTayra Hazais. Moshe, Ha'il, we don't know what that means yet. He, he, he's something. He hoyel. So he did something before bear. We know what bear means. Bear means explain. But hoyel, he's, he, 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 he's, he's something. He hoyel to be the bear as a terrorist. So the question, of course, what does hoyel mean? And what hoyel means will have an enormous impact on the word bear as a terrorist. Rashi tells us that the word hoyel, as it's mentioned here, and I, and I should tell you, this is not an absolute science because the word hoyel does appear elsewhere in the Bible. Elsewhere in the Chumash, and it means something else there. But here, in this case, it means Hiskil. Moshe Rabbeinu began. Where does Rashi 
find a common expression in the Apocrypha? Where does it say in the, in the Chumash or Tanakh the word Hoyl? And it means, and he began. It says Rashi, Kimoi, we find this with regard to Avram Avinu. When Avram Avinu was speaking to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and he was, he was pleading the case of the Sodomites, when Hashem informed him that they were going to be punished, and Moshe Rabbeinu is trying to defend them, and is trying to plead their case. So Moshe Rabbeinu, at some point in the argument, he says, Hine no hoi alti. And that means, I've just begun. I've just begun. And, and this is not to be understood as, as it says, says elsewhere. Sometimes the word ha'il means I want it. Ha'il sometimes is the terminology of rotsin. And, and for example, there is over there in, the, in that same chapter of Chumash, there's a passage where Avraham Avinu says ha'alti. And ha'alti over there means I want it. But that's not what it means here. Rashi is very specific that here it means I have only begun. He didn't know ha'alti, I've only begun. So if that's what it means with Avraham Avinu, you know, I've only begun, then we have to understand that the Ever Hayardin, here on the other side of the Jordan River, in the land of Moiv, Hoyil Moshe Be'er as Hatera Hazais. Moshe began to explain this Torah. Moshe began to explain the Torah. What does that mean? He began to explain it. it says Rashi Be'er. Be'er doesn't mean to explain. Be'er means to clarify, to, 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 to develop, to, to elucidate, to annotate. It means here, Beshivim Lashen. It means here in 70 languages Persia. Moshe Rabbeinu commented and explained in 70 languages, he explained the Torah. Now that's a quite, it's quite shocking to hear that Moshe Rabbeinu in the last five years of his life explained the whole Torah in 70 languages for a variety of reasons. Uh, chief amongst them is if Moshe Rabbeinu was a great translator, and if Moshe Rabbeinu was speaking to a variety of different people, as some of the Mufarshim say, there was the Eir of Rav, there was a mixed multitude that attached themselves to the Jewish people. Well, if that's the case, then why wasn't Moshe Rabbeinu doing this from the very beginning? If it was important that Moshe Rabbeinu should translate the Torah in different languages, then Moshe Rabbeinu should have been doing that for the last 40 years when he, when he taught the Torah. And who is he doing this for now at the very end of his terrestrial lifetime? I also have to tell you that not everybody agrees with Rashi on the word ha'il, and interestingly, they don't agree with Rashi on the word be'er. Ranban says, Ranban says that the word ha'il does mean, like it says later on in that same Pasuk of Chumash with Avraham Avinu, which is the 31st verse, and this is the for 27th, only a few Pesukim later. Ramban says, Moshe Rabbeinu wanted on his own. Ramban's terminology is ratza me'atzmai. Moshe Rabbeinu wanted, he wanted to do this. He wanted to explain the Torah, he was not commanded to do this. Reb Sajigon, who rendered the Torah into Arabic some 1,100 years ago or so, Reb Sajigon, he says, Herich, the terminology, at least the way we have it translated from Arabic, is he, 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 was, he explained it in a very lengthy, in a very detailed way. But Rashi maintains that Hoyl means, Hoyl means he began. And Rashi says it's Beshivim Loshin. It's in 70 languages. The Sepharno says he explained the Torah in a manner that he thought this would prevent the questions in the future. He knows that soon he's not going to be here anymore. He's got five, five weeks left. And in Zion other, he's going to be departing. So Moshe Rabbeinu now began to explain the kinds of things that they would, he would not be here to explain later on. So he's going to explain it in detail. And this way, there shouldn't be any questions. Chizkuni says he explained the mitzvahs. He recounted the mitzvahs here. He went through Aseris Hadibris. And the reason he did this is because many of the young people who were with Moshe Rabbeinu at that time were not actually at Mount Sinai, or did not remember being at Mount Sinai. Many of them were born after. So he wanted them to hear Aseris Hadibris from what the Chizkuni calls a Tzir Neman, from a trusted link, from a trusted, from a trusted connection. Mm -hmm. Trusted nexus. So, so therefore, they should hear it from the same person as everybody else heard it for. That's why he repeated Aseris Hadibris. Rebbeinu Bachai very interestingly points out that the word Moav, if you add it up, is the gematria of Memtes, of 49. So what's so special about Memtes? The Gemara says that the mayor was able to explain the Torah in 49 different ways. We have this idea of 49, Memtes Panim. 49 different ways of explaining the Torah. 
And therefore, he says, why do we talk about the Eved Hayyad and the Eretz Moya? The Bein says, like, we have twice coordinates. First, we have the first Yupsak who coordinates we never heard of before, or coordinates that don't even match. And now we give the exact coordinates and we give it twice. And when well, we really know where we are anyway, we know where we are because the Tzukim told us where we are. And they didn't go into Eretz Yisrael, and they didn't go back to the Midbar. So they have to be Beven Hayyad, they have to be Beven Smoyev. Why does the Torah have to tell it us? So the Beit Nebuchadnezzar says, says that's to tell you how many times Moshe Rabbeinu and how <coughs> he explained the Torah to them. The Balaturim says he talked to them about Yichud Hashem. He talked to them about intelligent faith. He explained to them the notion that there is one God and that everything ain't Mavad that is nothing other than God. So, so why does Rashi say he explained it in seventy ways when they have so many other ways to explain this that don't present the question? <laughs> seventy ways. Who's, who's he translating from? The, the, the Erevav spoke all 70 languages and Moshe Beno had to translate that himself. He couldn't find somebody else to translate. And anyway, what was the Erevav doing for 40 years in the desert? They couldn't take Hebrew as a second language. They didn't make a living. They didn't go shopping. What were they doing? They couldn't even do the garden because you never knew in the next place time they're going to leave. They didn't paint their houses. They were living in tents. What were they doing all day? Presumably, everybody wants to study Torah. The Medr says, The Torah was given to the people who ate the man. I mean, the Erev Rav, whoever was left of them, they also ate the man. So, so they would study Torah. I mean, it takes 40 years to learn Hebrew. It doesn't even make any sense. Why would you want to hear? You have, the, you have this incredible privilege of hearing from Meishu Rabbeinu, and they would no, we're not going to learn Hebrew. We're just going to twiddle our thumbs all day. And if, if Meishu Rabbeinu wants, he can talk to us in our language. The whole, the whole thing is, is so hard to understand. Why couldn't he say the, what the Sepharno says? The Sepharno says he began to explain the things which you're not going to know afterward. He's not here anymore. I mean, that's, that's so natural. In the Schneerson family, there's this tradition that before the Alter Rebbe was in Stalik, he asked his grandsons, is there any question you wanted to ask? Reflect, any question you want to ask? So we don't know what he's talking about. And that night he was in Stalik. This is the famous story with the Samach Tzedek. He said, what do you, you know, look on the top, what do you see? I see rafters, I see Kreyach Atel I see godliness. So in the Schneerson family, they have this tradition that the son of Rebbe Nachum Nochum, I think the middle of his grandson, had a, a deformed, uh, one of his, his left hand was deformed. He was missing fingers or something. And the Alter Rebbe meant, ask me what hand did you put on film. That's, 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 what, that's what they realized after. And then there's a whole story, what they did when the boy turned bar mitzvah, how, who, how they sent out tshuvas, the Nechemi the Debrovna the wrote up the tshuva, and they sent it to the Befrayim Margolis, Befrayim Zalman Margolis. The Nechemi the Brovna was, a, was a, a massive paisik, but he had a factory. He used to make talisim. So he signed the tshuva. He wrote up the tshuva, and he signed the tshuva, Nechemia Fabriker, Nechemia the, the, the factory, the factory owner. So Befrayim Zalman Margolis was not a Hasidish paisik, a very famous paisik at the time. He received this letter, he read it over, he said, tell me, you have a lot of factory makers like this? <laughs> he was blown away. Whatever, and there's a whole tshuva about what, what, what hand he used to put on film. And the saying, it's not like unheard of that before a great tzaddik, a great luminary passes on, like make sure, clarify things for later. You don't want to leave things in doubt. You don't want to leave things in question. You want to, why, 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 leave, why leave things that later the people will want to understand? And this infernal makes sense. It makes sense, especially because we know this is the final sermon, the farewell speech of Moshe. It makes sense. It makes it make what the Chizkuni says makes sense. It makes sense that he should say Obed Aseris Adibris. It makes sense. And it even makes sense. It makes sense to talk about. He explained the Torah forty nine ways that that is. It makes sense. What Rashi is saying seems to make no sense. And Rashi is Pshutoi. He's the simple, right? The Pshutoi Shol Mikra. Yo, Pshutoi. That's Rashi. What's Rashi? Seventy. Seventy languages. These are the proverbial seventy languages of humankind. So I think that the answer, I think that the answer to, to I mean, the, the, Rashi is quoting a medrash to be sure. That's, that, that's, that's what the medrash says. But the answer here would have something to do with the terminology of hoyo. So as we said, Ramban, Ramban says that it means, comes from the word ratzon, he wanted. And he says that Moshe Rabbeinu on his own accord decided to go ahead and explain the Torah. And that's, that's very problematic for Rashi. Where, where, where is there a hint that Moshe Rabbeinu did this on his own? That's a, that's a, that's a huge statement. Moshe Rabbeinu did this on his own. 
the, the Pashtus, the simple way to take it is Rabbi Shabbat was doing what Hashem commanded him to do. Especially because, as the Gemara tells us, it's almost as Misha hardly has free will anymore. He's like, he's just, he's just a conduit. He's a vehicle through which Hashem is speaking. So if Misha becomes a vehicle, and it's not even his words anymore, and Shechina medaberes b'tergreinah shal Meisha, the Shechina speaking through him, you're going to go ahead and tell me that the Shechina speaking through him was Meisha's own choice? So therefore, Ashi follows the idea that Hoyel means, Hoyel means he began. It's true, Reb Sajigon says it means he was Meirich, but there's no, there's nothing like that anywhere in the scripture. And that we know that's a major premise that Rashi uses in his interpretation and explanation of the Torah that he'll always use, he'll show you, here's where there's a word like that. And if there's no other word like that, Rashi will say, Ein lo eid mikra. There is no other similar word in the entire scripture. But here there is a word in the scripture. So if there's a word in the scripture, Rashi's going to tell you there's a word in the scripture. Why, why, why would he take a new path? So in, in, from Rashi's perspective, Hoyal has to mean he began. Comes the question, Moshe Rabbeinu. What's, what is he called? What's his name? Rabbeinu. What does Rabbeinu mean? Our teacher. That means the, the defining character of Moshe Rabbeinu was not his mi- miracle working, but he was a miracle worker. And there have been people in history known as Balanes. But that's not Moshe. It's not Moshe Balanes. The Gemara says Moshe Rabbeinu Melech Hoya is a king. He's not known to us as Moshe HaMelech. There are people known as HaMelech, David, Shleimah, and others. And Moshe Rabbeinu was a Navi. Not only a Navi, Ram, Ram, Rambam says the greatest Navi. The greatest Navi ever. Even Mashiach will be second to Moshe Rabbeinu in Nevoa. We don't call Moshe HaNavi. There are other people like that. Elio, Shmuel, people known as HaNavi. What's Moshe Rabbeinu known as? Rabbeinu. Rabbeinu. Why? Because his hallmark is not the Goyal, Moshe HaGoyal. He was a redeemer. No. He is Rabbeinu. What did he spend his whole life doing? Teaching Torah. Teaching Torah. So you tell Moshe Rabbeinu is teaching Torah for 40 years now. For 40 years he's teaching Torah. And now Hoyil he never explained the word he said. Now he's going to start explaining it. What did he do for 40 years? <laughs> it's, it's, that, that boggles the mind. For 40 years he was just saying words that nobody understood, and now he decided he's going to explain it. So to say that he explained it at length, or to say that he explained it in a way, in a manner that speaks to, he was well, now he was worried about the questions that would develop. Can Moshe Rabbeinu predict every possible question? Moshe Rabbeinu was the Pashtus saying the Torah, teaching Torah every single day of his life. And it doesn't take five weeks to say over a Sarah Sadibris. It doesn't take five weeks to repeat the mitzvahs. So you can't just say he's just repeating mitzvahs. Saying over, he does say over the Sarah Sadibris. That's true. That's in next week's Parsha. He does repeat mo, mo, many of the mitzvahs. That's true. But to say that's what he's doing, Hoyil, he began, he only began. Like Avraham Avinu said, he no ha'alti. I have just begun to speak. As that famous line goes, I have just begun to fight. I have just begun to speak. What he, the Meisha Wader was doing something he never did before. What did he never do before? He never translated the Torah to different languages. And that's why I would like to humbly suggest that Rashi reaches for this notion of Meisha Rabbeinu for that medrash and says the only way we can say pshuta shal mikra, the simplest way, is the most non-simple interpretation. The simplest thing, why? Because Rashi's problem is not so much the word be'er, Rashi's problem is the word hoyil. And since hoyil means began, if hoyil means began, then be'er has to mean something that didn't ever appear because it just began. And therefore Rashi used the medrash of translating it into 70 languages. I thought the part of the Greek interpretation was the first um, translation of the Torah. The first translation of the Torah that was made by a non-Jewish source. Yes, under duress. Yeah, okay, so that's, that's f- first of all, the famous question is that it says that that day was as difficult as the day as the Torah was burnt. And the Rebbe asks, what do you mean? If that was difficult, the Torah was burnt. What, what happened here? Moshe Rabbeinu himself translated the Torah. Right? Moshe Rabbeinu's translation is not necessarily preserved, which, of course, compounds the question then. If Moshe Rabbeinu's translation is not preserved, then who in heaven did he translate it for? And what is going on over here? The whole, I, I, in other words, like this, we can understand up till this point, we're going to go to page Yudalad, Sim Zion. We can understand until this point why Rashi has to say, use that medrash. But we, what we'll have difficulty, though, is what does it mean? For who was he doing this? That does not seem explained at all. 
So thankfully, the Rebbe did explain that to us. And the Rebbe gives us a really profound explanation, which, which is, which is um, it's, it's, it's not, only, it's not relevant, it doesn't really answer the question, but it, it speaks to us in a very important way, as you'll see. So we begin here with two questions. Yesh le this is, this is truly astonishing. Question one, we asked this question already. What was the purpose? What was the purpose of Tirgum Shal Hatayda Lashivim Lashim? Why translate the Tayyid into 70 languages? In those days, Dibru called me, so Abulashan Akedish. Everybody spoke the Hebrew tongue. Everybody spoke Hebrew. It's, it, it's simply incongruous to suggest that there was multitudes of Jewish people who only spoke some variation of the language that was other than Hebrew. Yeah, they ate over that. So that's what I said. For 40 years in the desert, they couldn't learn Hebrew. They didn't want to learn Hebrew. You join the Jewish people, you want to learn Hebrew. Most people who convert today want to learn Hebrew. It's one of the first things they want to do. Learn how to read Hebrew. Learn how to understand some Hebrew. If that's the spoken language everybody's talking about, that's, that certainly would be what they, what, they, what they want to speak. Number two. Let's say, you know, Moshe should have been worried about a single sheep, a single solitary individual. Maybe there's one person and he didn't speak. Okay. Even if there was a need to translate in such a manner. Let's say there was such a need. So Why does Paul Moshe Rabbeinu have to do it? For one, for one yukul who couldn't learn Hebrew. For one holdout who was still speaking Swahili. So let Moshe Rabbeinu speak to him. Let somebody else explain it to him. It's Moshe Rabbeinu's problem. It's only logical to say that if Moshe Rabbeinu spoke 70 languages, other people spoke languages too. Maybe not all 70, they spoke languages. So let somebody else. You have to waste Moshe Rabbeinu's precious time for one guy who couldn't be bothered to learn Hebrew? So these are the two big questions over here. Two big questions. For what purpose? Which we've articulated. And the second question we didn't talk about so much is, okay, why did Moshe Rabbeinu have to do it? The explanation my friends, as the Rebbe explained it, is as follows. The Torah was given in Hebrew. That is the original tongue of the Torah. Hasafa, the language, Shabbat Kaviyachal, that as if, if you could say, Medaber HaKadosh Baruch that God speaks, God's language. As Ramban explains in great detail in Pasha's Kisisa, where he takes the Rambam to task for saying that the Hebrew is called Lashon HaKodesh, the holy tongue. The Ramban says, the Rambam says, it's called Lashon HaKodesh because there's no swear words. Because there's no obscene words. And Ramban's like, what? That's why it's Lashon HaKodesh because there's no obscenities. Now, on some level, that's, that's the cleanliness and beauty of Hebrew because it's not, it's not made of... What Rambam means to say is that it's not a reflection of the common human experience. And part of the common human experience is obscene because... Human nature is obscene, so human nature has obscenities. So if human humans create a language, they're always going to have some kind of obscenities. If a language does have no obscenities, that means it's not a reflection of the human condition. If it's not a reflection of the human condition, where does it come from? It comes from, it comes from a, a place where there's, no, there's nothing obscene. Where is that? That's from heaven. That's really what the Ramba means, I think. But still, no, it's not Lashon HaKodesh, it's holy, so we ruled out the obscenities. That's, that's the natural result. If it comes from a different place... So it's not reflective of, of a human experience. Even so, Ramban is not satisfied. And he says, really what it means, really what it means is, he says that this is the language that Hashem created the world in, as is explained the great length in the Zohar. This is the language Hashem created the whole world in. And that's why, by the way, by, the Rebbe Rashab was very unhappy with the reconstitution of modern Evrit. He felt that this was a, and many other G'dayli saw, he felt that this was a Begida, a rebellion against Hashem, in using a holy tongue for common language. And you should know that over time, over the ages, we always had two languages. Jewish people had a holy language, they talked Torah and Mitzvahs, and a language that they communicated in. The Kuzari says this. The Kuzari uh, asked the question, he imagines the Khazar king would have asked the Chacham, he said, you're telling me that Abraham spoke Hebrew, huh? He was Hebrew. Yeah, he, he was the Hebrew, Abraham, yeah. He says, so what language did you speak as a child? And who taught him Hebrew? So the Kuzari there says that he was taught Hebrew by Noach. Noach had it, spoke Hebrew. Avraham Avinu came to Noach's yeshiva. But he says that Avraham Avinu actually spoke two languages. He spoke Aramit, Aramaic, which is a very ancient language, and he used that for divrei choil, for weekday things. 
from mundane things, and he spoke Lashon HaKadosh when he spoke holy things. So that's why the idea that Jewish people have always had a secondary language. Why did they speak Hebrew? It's strange. We always were, always were, were literate. How come the Sephardic Jews created Ladino? It's not language that anybody other than Jewish people understood. How come Yidin in Europe created Yiddish? How come they just speak Hebrew? They always wrote in Hebrew. The answer is, we Dafka didn't want to speak Hebrew. Now, of course, many will maintain that Ivrit is a modern variation of a Hebrew and Ladino because it's full of peppered with other languages. It's got Arabic, it's got English, it's got French, it's got a whole slew of languages that Ben Yehuda sold together languages from all over, and therefore they would say Ivrit is not Lashon HaKadosh. And when you start with an Israeli to learn Chumash, and he thinks he knows what he's talking about, but he actually doesn't. Right? The Butnim are, are peanuts, but in, in, in the Chumash they mean like apricots, or they mean uh, uh, cashews or something else. They, they definitely don't mean peanuts. And there's so many other words like that, which mean one thing in Ivrit and something else. Anyway. So, so um, Lashon HaKadosh, the holy tongue, the holy tongue. Another reason, by the way, is that language changes. All language changes. Language evolves. It's impossible for language not to evolve. So we don't want Hebrew to evolve. This is the holy. We want the Chumash to change. So we don't want to use Hebrew. If we use Hebrew for other things other than study. It would evolve. We want to maintain its pristine purity, and that's why we have such a hard time with Hebrew grammar, Lashon Hakodesh grammar, because nobody speaks it. <laughs> If it's a word which is used often in the Torah, no problem. If it's a word that shows up once or twice in the whole Torah, so the Pashtani and Mikra go uh, 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 banging their heads against so What does this mean? Why don't you know what it means? Don't you speak Hebrew? Yeah, we speak Lashon HaKadosh, but this is a word that it shows up one time. So the only place you find uh, holy Hebrew is in the Torah, not in the, in the prophets and sacred. Or... Most of the prophets are written in Lashon HaKadosh also. Not all of the prophets. Some of them are written in, Aram- no additional in Aramaic. Um, we have the Mishnah's written Hebrew. The Gemara is not, but the Mishnah is. Do you have additional words above the Torah? There are some words that are not found anywhere else. Actually, Rashi sometimes has to reach for a Mishnah in order to explain a, le- a word in the Chumash, because the word is used only once in the Chumash, and it's not used in circulation. But if you look in the Mishnah, ah, that will give you. All right, so, so it's, it's Hebrew. It's a holy tongue. What's the natural state for, of learning Torah? In what language is Torah given? Lashon HaKadosh. So then what should constitute Torah study? Lashon HaKadosh, Hebrew. Here we are learning Torah in English. Is this Torah learning? Who says? Maybe this is not Torah learning. Maybe we should be speaking Hebrew. And maybe if we're not speaking Hebrew, we're not studying Torah. How do you know Torah was given a Lashon HaKadosh? Says the Rebbe. B'kach shemeisha tirgim u'pirish asatera. B'chol shivim in, in In translating the Torah in the last five weeks of his life, in every single language, in every language available to him. So whatever forerunner of, it was of English or the Romance languages that was spoken at the time, that's the language Moshe used. Obviously, he didn't have Castigiano or Espanol or Portuguese or French or, or, or German or English. He didn't have those languages. But whatever language he had, because all language is evolutionary, and we know that all these languages evolved from Latin. So whatever pre-Latin reality that was at the time of Moshe, that's what he spoke in. And because Moshe Rabbeinu, in the last five weeks of his life, translated the Torah into whatever preceded the languages we speak today, he uses the, the, the range of language that was available to him. Guess what happened? Moshe Rabbeinu essentially heralded a new horizon in the dissemination of Torah. He promulgated a new gate, a new segue into being able to learn Torah and in doing so connecting to Hashem. Because when we learn Torah, we come on with Hashem. We're absorbing godly ideas. So Moshe Rabbeinu is breaking new ground here. This is spiritual. new spiritual ground, obviously. Terra incognita on a, on a spiritual, a spiritual plat- plateau. Because up until this point, Torah was never taught in another language. This is the Rebbe's first. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Mamash amazing. So, so Kach, Moshe Rabbeinu, his, his Chumash Devarim was not just for the people who were there. Yeah. For us, he's Rabbeinu. We call him Rabbeinu, our teacher. Moshe Rabbeinu is our eternal teacher. Do you know what Moshe Rabbeinu spent the last five weeks of his life doing? Worrying about us on Thornhill. Or wherever else in the world people learn Torah. That in a language they will speak Torah, that it should be Torah. Because he knew, practically speaking, there will be people who will not understand Lashon HaKadosh. And if they will never have a chance to learn Lashon HaKadosh, 
they will never be able to learn Torah. And that's why the Torah was written when the, when 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 Sajigor interpreted he interpreted the Torah to Arabic because that was the language people were speaking. When the Rambam wrote a Peter Shemeshnai or a Sefer Mitzvah, he wrote it in Arabic because that was the language that most of the Jews are living in his part of the world are speaking. And if he would have written in the Lashon Hakodesh, nobody know what he's talking about, so he would gain nothing. The Mishnah wouldn't be explained. And throughout the ages, the sages have translated the Torah into various mediums, various different forms of language, various different, different forms of expression. But this is all following in the footsteps of our eternal teacher, Moshe Rabbeinu. So that whatever language we will speak in, like, and here we go into something the Chizkuni alludes to, Bitsir Nema, the loyal link, the same Moshe Rabbeinu that gave us Aseris Adibris, the same Moshe Kibbal Teir Misinai, that same Moshe Rabbeinu, who, who Moshe Rabbeinu, he is the one who transmits the Teir, he is the only one that he is able to actually broaden the, the, the defining hallmark of Torah. He can, he, can, he can expand the framework of Torah to include all languages, including whatever language you might speak. The concept, the full gamut of language. If Moshe Rabbeinu would use one or the other language, it wouldn't be the full gamut of language. It wouldn't work for us till today. But because he used every language available to him at the time, so that expanded the range of Torah into the entire gamut of language, of human expression. And therefore, Moshe Rabbeinu is the one, Lahaschil, Gam al Sophis and Mesophis. So we explain two things now. First of all, for who is he translating? And what's the answer? The me and you. And second, why did Moshe Rabbeinu have to do it? Because the, the reason that Moshe, once we understand why he's translating the Torah, the reason that he's translating the Torah, which was not simply for those who were listening to him, terrestrially, should be able to understand, but rather those who were listening should be able to, those who will learn Torah till the end of time should be able to connect to Hashem in any language that will study Torah. That this ultimately all links back to the concept of Moshe. Only Moshe Rabbeinu be the one to be able to do that. And that, my friends, is the introduction to Chumash Dvarim. When you read Chumash Dvarim, do not read a Chumash. Do not read words of Torah which are being said to a particular generation. Oh, they didn't hear from Har Sinai, so they have to hear it from Moshe. Great. So that's what you extended it for one more generation. What happens generation after that? What happens thousands of years after? But that's a mistake of, of Chumash Dvarim. The proper understanding, the proper context of Chumash Dvarim is that it speaks not only to his generation, but to the people standing in front of him. But Moshe Rabbeinu speaks in a voice that truly reverberates over the ages up until our time, just before the coming of Mashiach. <laughs> 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 <laughs>